Ah, welcome to episode 10 of Data Mesh TV. Today, Srinivas Paluri and I will be talking about data products, but we'll be talking about that in the context of a rum book. Now, a lot of us, I'm surprised actually, uh, having seen a number of data meshes kind of out in production, working really well, mature data meshes. The idea of a rum book, maybe that's old school, right? Maybe that's something we used to do in the old days. Maybe some people would say that's waterfall, that's old operations. In today's world of DevOps, in today's world of Agile, that the documenting these old run books, these operations guides, um, maybe we don't do that so much anymore. But I, I love the concept of a run book. I love the concept of a set of procedures that describes how you build the data product. And so whether or not you're actually going to build the run book, I want to use that as a backdrop for the conversation as we talk through what building a data product feels like, what it looks like. And we can talk through the differences uh, that might appear from organization to organization. We won't focus so much on the technology, but we also want to understand a little bit about what some of the benefits or some of the strengths are to some of the different approaches. So let's jump into data products with a backdrop of a run book as the concept, and let's see how we go. Srinivas, ready for the show. How are you doing? Welcome. I'm doing great. Um, th thanks, thanks for inviting me. Here again. I'm glad to be we, here. We've done a couple of chief wine officer events where we sit down with a number of customers uh, and friends and we talk about data, data mesh over a glass of wine. Do, do you have a glass of wine today, Mr. Nevis? No, no. Actually, I, 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 I've not been drinking for a while. So. Oh, okay, okay. It's, yeah, you're you, you're, it's you're drinking the apple really. cider usually. <laughs> Well, I don't have any wine either, but it's okay if the audience does. It's the audience does. So let's let's jump right into it. I uh, let's let's first kind of and we we don't like to use too many slides. Right? I, love, I love to have the free, the open conversation. We have thirty minutes, and so I think what we might do. Let's play it this way, right? Let's let's talk about the structure of building a data product, and we'll keep it simple. I would love, and I'm asking you cold here without having discussed it earlier. I would love for you and I to maybe write an article or a blog later, because there's a lot that we're not going to get into uh, in today's conversation that I think would fit really well into a structured blog. And we can call it data product run book. And again, just thinking through the procedures or the activities that one would go through to build one. But I'll see if I get this right, Srinivas. In your organization, first of all, do you guys use run books? Uh, we use run books, some run books for the operational use cases, right? Like, um, but, but definitely, like you know, I, I think a run book is a a detailed how to guide for doing something, right? It's basically uh, they might exist in terms of documents and processes that outside we might right. not call run books, but they, 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 there are like run books that we use for managing our, our software products, um, in infrastructure products. But definitely, like you know, I don't think I never thought about a run book for data products until I talked to you, right? I, I think I was great to talk about, oh, what, is, what could be in, in the run book when, when we create something like that? If I were writing a run book for um, a domain, right? And so something to kind of think about also is when we are building a data mesh and we have different domains, first thing I would say is I don't know that the procedures in every domain are the same, right? If we're following the idea of federated governance, if we're following the idea of designing a domain for a specific consumer group, the first thing I would say is, I do think that there are some consistent processes you wanna follow across all the domains, but I also think when you're writing your procedural guide or when you're thinking about how to write that run book, I think you would say, in this domain, this is the way they work. Maybe they're um, using higher risk data sources. Uh, maybe they're building different types of data products, bigger data products. Uh, maybe they're tied to a different set of compliance rules. And so I think the procedures will vary by domain, not completely. Maybe there's, here's what we all do the same and here's what everybody does differently. But let's break this out. Let's start, if we were, simplest way to think about this, I think, Shrenivas, uh, see if you've got a better way. But I would say discover, build, and consume, right? If somebody were going to say, what are the three steps to build a data product? Discover, build, and consume. Let's talk about that discovery piece first, right? So if we're writing a procedural guide for discovery, what do you think would go would, would fall into that? What are the steps there on the discovery side? Um, so I think you started with the domains, right? I think it's 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 important that like you know we understand 
what's the domains that you are thinking and uh, what is the domain of ownership means like you know, there could you said like you know there could be like you know a, a domain a might be different from domain b in characteristics but in general there are common principles that every domain needs to do right like you know okay what is the ownership of the domain means right um what is the when i'm thinking about like you know developing data products within the domain how is it going to be interoperable with, with, with other domains like you know if, if you have a consumer data and then you have the sales data you want to combine those two things together right so you need to be thinking about like oh how is my domain is going to interact with others right so, other, yeah. other things. Um, so definitely like and i think um you your discovery phase uh, i tie that one up to prioritization right the prioritization of the data data products that you need to serve the business so you, sh- you should always like you know okay what is most important for the business and what are the data products that we need uh, in order to develop these capabilities within the company and how they tie to these domains i think we just need to do that one. that's all comes under the discovery phase um and, and I, i think that is critical right i think it's the way that you want to convince the 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 domain owners or the business that we need to invest in this thing is because they have a value right they all all the data products i call like you know every data product has to have a, a purpose for that right like you know yeah. if, if you don't have a purpose like then you just you better go and delete them right like you don't need them yeah. So if I'm discovering, if I'm a, uh, and let's, that's, you know, cause you brought up a good point there. I'm thinking about, well, who, who am I writing this for? Right. I think when we talk about these procedures, maybe first, let me think about the, the data product owner or the data product developer, the, that person, or the person building the data product. And so I think from a, from a discovery perspective, you, I want to make sure that that person understands how to access the data for their domain. Like you said, right. How do I get data for my domain? Now, um, depending on what technology you're using, I don't want to get too far into the technology side, that, that'll differ, right? If I am having to go directly to different sources and, and build pipelines to them, that, that's one way to do it. Um, if I'm using Trino and buy, writing a federated query, okay, maybe that might be a little bit easier. Uh, but there's different ways to get access to that backend data. So that's the first set of procedures for discovery is how do I get to the data? The second piece, I think, on the discovery It's going to be really important, Srinivas, I think, is the access piece, right? The, the biggest challenge, even if you're a data product developer, the biggest challenge oftentimes is getting access to data that it's not already available. I need access to a new data set. I need access to a new source. I think that's a critical piece of that process, right? Uh, and it, whatever you can do to simplify that or provide them access in advance is going to accelerate the process. And so discovery is really important. It's about ideation. It's about finding something. If somebody says, well, what are you looking for? I'm a data scientist. I was like, I don't know. <laughs> I don't always know. That's the beauty of, uh, of, of invention is I don't have the question yet, right? I'm looking to see how to do this in a different way, but I need to see what's available before I invent it, so to speak. So again, I think that discovery is really important. And as you said, you're looking at the discovery from the lens of a domain. Yeah, de- yeah, de- definitely. I think um, one one thing like you know everybody wants to know is what is available right now, right? You don't you don't want to um, like you know, create a duplicate data, right? So I think one of the challenges with the discoveries is I, I know you mentioned about the access, but also the designing. I think we're going to go into the build right now, uh, which is like a designing. Um, do you have a right data model, right? So does your data model has a self-described schemas that like you know it is easy for us to search like you can put a search engine on top of that see okay what is the data that is available and if you are using ambiguous names and like you know these cryptic names it will be super difficult for anybody to understand what data that is available and, and god knows how they can use this thing right like you know and, and they end up actually using in quality right so so the, the, the discovery piece is also tied up with how you design your data products like the data models and the access piece right So those both of them are it's critically important. Absolutely, you know, and and before we go on to the next piece, build, I'll say one more thing. You get you you hinted on it. There is, if I'm a data product owner and I'm I've been tasked with building a new data product, before I go discover raw data sets, the first thing I probably should do is search the catalog. Does it, has somebody else built this data product, right? And so be, the ability to go into your catalog and do a search and say, hold on, I'm looking for a keyword. And then look at all the other data products that have already been built with the data you're looking for. 
that might be the fastest way to, to the outcome, right? And if that doesn't exist, then you can go build it. So let's pretend it doesn't exist. All right, so now you, you, you've done, gone through discovery, you've found the data sets you're looking for, maybe a table from that system and a field from here and a table from over there. Um, and so now I know what I've got. Now we get into the design and, and build phase. This is, this is the, uh, hopefully discovery was fast. If you're spending too much time on discovery, good luck with, with Bill, right? But hopefully your discovery didn't last much more than a, an hour. Uh, that maybe I'm being too aggressive. Is that even realistic? How, how much do you think this, how long should discovery take? Let's put a time scan on this. Right now, uh, I mean, I'll tell you what, it, it takes a long time. Right? It does. It's, it's, uh, it's because uh, we don't understand what business logic that a data product exists, right? So, and what use cases that it's been created for. But if we create a well-defined data catalog with what use cases that it's been serving and what is the purpose of those things and it has the right lineage, like you know, what is the other data products that are being actually being created uh, using these things, so what reports are being done. So if you yeah. have all that specific information available in the data portal for search for, I, I don't think it should take like more than an hour, right? Like, you yeah. know, um, but maybe it's like they might have some questions and then they know exactly what persons they, they can talk to because they have a data, data product owner right there in the catalog. And then they have people that are using the data products so there's all that like information is that are at one place. So even if they don't have an answer, they don't exactly whom to ask for. Um, so not only like you you'll be able to discover what it is and then how you can use it, but also in case if you need more information, who to talk to. So I, and, and what I'm what I'm hearing there, it's it's, it's, it's it was very very hard. Right, like, I can yeah. tell like you know even that that's where like you're designing a good data product is tied up with a good data model and have a, a good self described. Um, um, uh, schemas is, is critical. Fantastic. And maybe what I'm hearing also there is maybe it's, it's like it depends on, on the maturity, right? Um, a more mature data mesh or a more mature domain that already knows how to get to their data, that already knows what data is available to the domain, that is already connected to all the data sources that they need. That domain, the discovery for them is going to go a lot quicker than a brand new domain that is just trying to figure out, hey, I have access to all this data. Great. I don't, I've never seen it. Right. So I'm seeing this data for the first time. Discovery is going to naturally take a bit longer when I get ready to start to build. Let me, let me toss some because there's a lot here to consider. And I'm going to just toss some a couple of ideas on there that I think we typically get in, 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 in customer sessions. One of them is um, when you design a data product, interoperable is something we're all excited. About. We think about when you read the, the book, right? You're like, ah, oh, the idea of an interoperable data uh, product taking a data product that can be used in Power BI or Tableau or, uh, you know, fed into a machine learning engine or fed into some advanced analytic algorithm. That is fantastic, but it's hard, right? Mm -hmm. Let's be honest, to build a truly interoperable data product, it's a little bit tricky because every one of those uh, solutions has a slightly different requirement. Do you build currently, how, how interoperable are your data products? Do you design for a specific solution or do you try to make them truly work across multiple? So the way that I look at again, like the interoperable is the two things, right? So one is uh, interoperable between the domains, right? So each domain has a purpose, has um, the logic, business logic specific to that business. Um, so if you are building these domains and then the data products within these domains, you need to understand how the overall business is going. Like, let's say if you have a customer, so that is going to the funnel, right? So they come to the website, um, they, they see something, and then like, you know, they ended up actually buying some, uh, some stuff in that uh, website. So, but they are in different domains. Um, so how, when we develop these data products, how these data products can connect with each other seamlessly yeah. and then be able to actually do that, right? So that's, that's number one. I think the second one that you covered, right, which is, how these uh, data products will be able to be like accessible through um, um, like Tableau or like uh, Trino or like you know some other uh, technologies choices that we have. So, so let, let's talk about the number one, right? So, um, how do we make the data more uh, interoperable between the data products so that like we understand what we are doing? So, number one is understanding the business, right? So, so two, um, understanding what is the uh, not just like you know doing a silo development within your domain, but also going beyond your domains and like how your data product is going to be used, how it can be connected with other data sources. Um, then you'll find 
guidelines, right? Like, you know, maybe then we have a customer ID that uh, that we needs to be common across these products, data products, or or, um, or we have a property ID in our case, right? Like, you know, you 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 need to be common and then uh, use across these things. It's kind of a joint key, right? So, so you develop these uh, guidelines within your domains and within the business that you you should follow, right? Yeah. Um, so number two. Um, I, I, I think it's once you make the design, um, the, the data product is designed, um, the self-service platforms that we are building, like anybody like this, one of the, <clears throat> one of the aspects for uh, the data mesh is self-service platform, right? Like, you know, I think that's the team that should take care of, like, you know, how do you enable the data platforms that are interoperable between different platforms that they are building? If they are leveraging the self-service platforms, I think it should be pretty easy. Uh, if not, probably that's that's where it get really expensive. I, I'm gonna do. I want to. I want to add a little bit to that, and then what I want to do for build is I'm gonna. Uh, we'll try to make it like a yes or no, right? So we'll make it a bit a bit quick because there's a, a couple of things here that I want. I, people are curious about. It's like, well, do you do this? Yeah. So let's let's see if we can sh we can do scatter shooting a little bit on some other topics. But just to add to what you just described, here, here's what else I would say. I think um, when you build, I. I, I tell people to build at least for right now. So we're we're in, in kind of the early stages of data mesh for most 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 companies. At this level of maturity, I would say focus on building fast data products for your customers, right? So build a data product that meets that customer's need, that consumer's need, and then let, let it go and let them drive. And if another customer has almost the same need for the same data product, but for a different solution, they want it for Tableau, but they want it for um, a, a different type of algorithm and that product needs to be a little bit different, build them a different data product. The reason I say that is because I know today I would say it doesn't cost, well, at least with, with Starburst, it's not gonna cost you any more money to build two data products or three data products or four data products. And you would say, well, aren't you duplicating data? We're never moving the data. The data stays at the source. All you're doing is giving them a different window to the same data. So right now in this maturity stage, I would say build a data product for the consumer I think in the next maturity stage, we can come back and we can look at optimizing and say, see these data products, they all kind of look the same. Maybe there's an opportunity to optimize it for performance or for risk or for cost, and you can bring them together. But I think that's a later stage. Right now, the value is in the ideation. So let, let, let me toss some questions out there. Lifecycle management. Do you guys manage data products in, in a like a, a true life cycle? We do application lifecycle management, microservice lifecycle management. Do, do you guys actually manage the life cycle of a data product? Um, define define life cycle. What do you think? So, so I would say life cycle. Uh, so I've got um, a product goes from the ideation phase. Uh, and I'm just I'm thinking data life cycle. I think it fits really well over data product life cycle. I, I discover I ideate on a data product. I, I build it. I publish it. And then you go through this phase of iteration, improve, yeah. iteration, improve, iteration, improve. At some point, it gets archived or it gets uh, deleted or it gets, you know, at some point it, it, it's life ends, so to speak, right? The, the, use, the, the uh, usefulness of that data product is no longer um, there. And so you, you get rid of it, so to speak. Do you manage a life cycle in that, in that fashion? Uh, I, I wouldn't say that like, no, we nailed it, right? Like we have a process to do that, but we do think about that. Right? So we do think about like, you know, so you, we talked about like, you know, the, the process that I think of is like, you know, so we have a data product specification, right? You understand what's, yeah. uh, what we need it for, right? Like, you know, uh, and then I have a data product design. So I think that's where we're talking about, like, you know, I like your approach where like, you know, using the, the agile approach, which is, oh, you, customer A needs a data product, do it. Customer B needs another data product. So they might have some duplication. Let's do it and then go to the stage two to combine them or like, you know, identify the duplication. So that's where the data product design happens for us. So it's kind of an architect that actually looks into this. Um, so how do we design the data products? Do we have the right uh, granularity of the data products? Yeah. Uh, are we doing too many data products? Do we have to duplicate the products? Will you spend some effort at that time, right? Um, so then the implementation of that thing happens. So then comes the truth, right? Which is the maintenance, data change management. So yeah. I think that's probably like an underestimated within the, um, in, in any, in, like, you know, in, like, in, in, the, in, in the data management and managing the data products, because before, like, the data engineering team, my team was doing all this stuff. So now, the data product owner should be maintaining these things. So there comes a cost, right? Like, they need to do documentation, or they need to meet SLOs, so the data needs to be delivered on time. 
Uh, they need to write uh, the data, data contracts. And if any data contract fails, they need to go back and investigate and uh, fix those uh, the data issues. And they deprecate the data products. So it's one of the things, right? It's like one of the life cycle is if the data product is not being used, we don't want to waste resources, like spending resources to store and process and use the data, right? Like if nobody's using the data, just go and delete it, right? So um, it's kind of a less data than like, I don't need to worry about the complaints. There's another thing that like we need to worry about compliance and, and security. So the lower, less data that I have, I, I need to be worrying about that one. So, and then also change management, right? Like, you know, people- Well, let me, let me, I want to jump on the change management because I think that is, um, that comes up a lot, right? And it is, I have, an, I, uh, I have an, a strong opinion on this, right? I think we have to be really careful. Look, I I came from, you know, uh, you know, I've, I've worked, I've, I've been an auditor. <laughs> I've worked in security. I've, I've, I've worked in different facets of IT operations where I understand the importance of change management. Here's what, here's what I would say. When you deploy a mesh, I think there are some domains where you would look at them and say, this, fit, this is fit for purpose change management. This is how I need to manage change. There may be some domains where there's no change management, right? They're they're doing so much discovery so quickly, and their team is so small that you don't. The change management is just unnecessary governance for that discovery or ideation team. There are other domains where you need hard, you know, uh, change management and everything in between. The reason I say that is because I think often when we apply that level of governance and we're too thick with it, so too much. With, I think we we slow discovery down, we slow value down, so apply the right amount of change management to meet the needs of that consumer and ask the consumer what kind of change management is appropriate. Don't just go in there and take the change management book off the shelf that you applied everywhere else in the company and apply it to data products. I, I just think it's not, you're, you're hurting yourself. You're devaluing the, the, you know, the overall value of that data mesh. So, uh, absolutely. I, I use, I use an analogy like, you know, it's friction on the road, right? Like, you know, yeah. Uh, it's, I, I was learning physics, right? Like, and we talked about friction. Also, what keeps the car on the road? It's, it's, it's a friction. Well, what happens if you don't have friction? Oh, this car goes everywhere, right? Like, it, it, you don't have any directional movement on the car. But if, if you don't, if you have too much friction, the car doesn't go anywhere, right? So we need to balance out what is the right amount of friction that we can go smoothly, that yes. kind of like 80 miles per hour. Like, we need to, I think, I, I, think I, I like the way that you said it's, it's not just the team specific things. I mean, sometimes within, Within the domains, like you know, the governance could be like you know flexible and uh, the change management. Yeah, better way to governance. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Well, on that same kind of line of thought, the um, I think the other thing that we in your procedures, um, steps that people take that sometimes make change management really complicated, right? I I personally, and I know I don't like building data products from other data products. I don't like that. Uh, I think the more you create these extra steps. So, so I would say my data product is dependent on these two data products and those two data products are dependent on these three data products. You create a mess that, and I, and I know that some of us do that and, and I, and I'm not, sometimes you have to do that. I, I get it. Um, get a mess, I don't like doing get a mess. it. <laughs> I, don't, I don't like doing it. Yeah. You know, the, the pink hat, hot data mess, but it, what, what, I, what I would prefer to do is I would try to get for every data product, I would try to get the data from the source. And, and if, you, if there's three data products that you want to use to build yours, I mean, again, every, every technology is different. The way that I advise customers to do it is go into those data products, copy that code, that query, and then, and then create a new data product, right? You're going back to the source just like they are. You're not moving the data. It's not going to cost you any more money. But that, that way you have a standalone product. And no matter what they do to their data products, you're not dependent on them. The only dependency you have is changes at the source. So when you think about change yeah. management, think about that lineage because I think it it could create it could create some problems. We're going to run out of time. I want to come back to consume. On the consume side again, we're thinking about the procedures and the product. We talked about building a data product. We talked about the discovery pieces. We talked about the actual um, build and design pieces. Change management was the dominant topic there. And now we're talking about the, the consumption side, right? The, the procedures for consuming a data product, which are, somebody would say, are the most important. I built a great data product. Where is it? Can I access it? Who's using it, right? And so on the consumption side, what, how do you guys view, how do you train or how do you advise your consumers to kind of to, to use your data products? 
I think it goes back to discovery, right? Like, <laughs> like you know, can, can they go and discover the data, data for it? Um, yeah. so, and then the second one is you need to provide the trust on the data that, that exists. Like you know, the data consumers needs to understand, oh, these products are being actively managed. Like I can trust on these things, right? Um, so I, I, I talked about certification, right? I, I, I talked in one of my LinkedIn blog about how do we certify the data? So what is the criteria that you need to do to certify the data? Uh, I think the certification is, is a great thing uh, to earn the, the consumer's trust and as well as provide a tool uh, for the producers to um, uh, provide this high quality data sets. And, and the third one is, I think I hate to say it's like, uh, we don't talk about a lot of infrastructure and then the platforms, but I think it's, this is where the consumption side of the platforms comes a lot, right? Like now once you discover the data, what is the right tools for you to access the data, right? <laughs> like, you know, um, I, I think this is where like, you know, I, I, I cannot just say, oh, I'm, I'm not going to talk about the technologies, but I think you need to find the right technologies and tools on like, you know, okay, so you got, you got the right data, data models, you got the right data sets, you got the trust on them, you certify them. So what is the right tools for you to access this data? And what is your customer's need, right? I mean, every customer, every company requires a certain, um, uh, uh, they have their own requirements on how, how to access the data. So you need to find out what's your company needs and, and, and then board in the right infrastructure and platform to access the data. You know, we, 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 there's so much to talk about, Bill, which is why I really want to write an article with you about this, um, maybe post, post session. But one thing that we didn't cover on the build side was, and you just, you, you hinted at that there is if when you build a data product, you want to make sure that you've got all the right metadata. If you've, if you've done a good job with the metadata, then when you get ready to consume, just as you started out, it'll be easier to discover. And when somebody pulls that data product off the catalog or off the shelf and they, and they can look at it and say, here's how to use it. Here's where the data comes from. Here's who owns the data. Here's other people that are using it, so to speak. Man, that's incredibly valuable because yeah. then they're, they're off to the races, so to speak, and, and they're able to use it almost immediately. That's when we talk about time to insight. The time to insight for that consumer, the, start, the clock starts from the moment that they say, I'm looking for X. Their ability to find X fast and then deploy X into their solution and then do something with the answer. So I found the data, I put it together in a dashboard or something, and then I made a decision. That's time to insight. So yeah, the, the consumption piece is, is super important. Oh, let me ask you on the consumption piece, something that I, I see a lot more customers doing now is this idea of not just training people on the tools, and, and you, you, you see this in the book, in the Data Mesh book as well, the idea of, of treating your consumer also as a data steward, training them on how to protect data because you're giving them access now to more data. There's ethics. There's, you know, obviously data privacy. There's all kinds of things they should consider as a data steward of a data product. Any thoughts on that? Um, I mean, your consumers, like, you know, the, the people who are using is the ones that are actually providing uh, what you need what they need, right? Like, you know, I mean, it's right. basically, uh, they should be part of your ecosystem. Uh, and number two, I think that's, um, so there is a lot of PI data, like, you know, so the data that they should be able to use it. Um, I think there are two ways that we can do. So one is the education, right? Like, yeah. you know, training them, like, you know, this is the data and these are the restrictions that you have. Um, I think the, the, the second, the best way is uh, using automation, right? Like, you know, using the, the platform, like uh, controls. Uh, infrastructure and uh, and 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 the uh, and the platform to control the access to this data so that like you, know, you don't you don't make those mistakes right if that metadata that is available from the from the producers what the restrictions and how they should be using it and we should be automating those things so that like you know, we don't make these silly mistakes even if you train those folks right I think they are sometimes happen so you want to protect yourself especially given the privacy laws that are going around and like you know the, the united states is just going right like you know it, um, uh, enacting a lot of uh, uh, privacy laws um, so it's important that like you know using education plus tooling to protect ourselves yeah yeah uh, without a doubt i uh every one of those steps is so important right um the, the speed of discovery the efficiency of the build and the design um, and then the simplicity of the consumption, right? Those are, you know, three great principles for a data mesh on top of the four pillars that already exist. I, if I were to add one more layer to the conversation, so we talked about discover, build, consume. If I were to add one more layer that maybe sits across the bottom, it would be governance. 
right? And we think about the governance procedures. We talked a little bit about access and how important mm -hmm. access is. If I were making an argument for a run book, Srinivas, I would say for an auditor or for somebody who's on the InfoSec side or on the compliance side, that run book is, is what I use to assess whether or not I've got good controls in place end to end, right? And so if I'm building a mesh and I've got a InfoSec team uh, around the corner that's just not aligned or worried about what I'm doing, the idea of opening access is, is crazy. What are you doing? I, I can hand them a run book to say, this is the way that we operate. Um, and then these are the changes we've made per domain. I think it's, it's super helpful, uh, not only for the auditor, but it also ensures that they, they can go back and, and check to make sure people are doing things correctly. How do you, in your kind of procedural and the current processes that you guys have, how involved is the, the, the kind of the, your audit or your governance teams? How involved have you seen people into the, in the data product development piece? Are they, are they looking over the shoulder and saying, yeah, I see what you guys are doing? Because data science is, is, on, is, over, is way over here. And maybe some people would say audit hasn't caught up with it. I don't know. Yeah. We, we, we have some guidelines, right? Like we draw some guidelines. Uh, number two, uh, uh, we have formal reviews, right? Like, you know, um, especially on, on, the, on the legal privacy side, like, you know, like if you're already mortgages, just like, you know, they have, uh, uh, I, I don't want to go through all, all the corners. Right, 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 right. No, 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 yeah, yeah. Hello, hello. If you have it, you better have a formal um, review process for that one. Right? You don't want to risk that one, right? So you, yeah. like, you talked about the fiction, right? Like, you know, what's the fiction that you want to do? I, I would rather put, I would put more fiction here so that we don't, we don't make any mistakes, big mistakes here, right? So, and yeah. the third one is, so we use um, um, automation anomalies, um, like machine learning to identify oh, where like somebody could have missed um, these compliance issues. Or, like, you know, we, I mean, you can, you can look at like an you know, email addresses and, and, and use a pattern and find out like, no, there's a PI data. I know somebody forgot to mention that there's a PI data. So, so we can do that. Right? So, so have your like, you know, toolbox equipped with multiple tools, like in this, in this case, processes, yeah, and then use the right tool when, depending on the team and, and when you need those tools. Awesome. Well, we did not nearly enough time to cover everything that we want to cover. I'm looking forward to writing a blog with you if you'll if you'll join me, Shunivas. But I thank you so much for, for the show. I think uh, these 30 minute excitements uh, on one side aren't enough time, but at the same time, I think it's nice to have a quick conversation that people can listen to to get some ideas. And I hope for our audience that we've shared some good ideas. Thank you for joining us, Shunivas. Uh, thank you, thank you again. We're all learning together here uh, with, with the data mesh. Like you know, I I'm happy to share my thoughts and, and learn from others as well. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, another great show. Hopefully, you enjoyed this session with Shrinivas talking about not just data products um, uh, in detail, but it's taking a step back and looking at the core processes. Right? You know, the the discoverability processes, the build processes the consumption processes and, and governance. And I know, that, as I said, uh, kind of had a quick discussion, but hopefully I think uh, everybody can understand one, the value of understanding the process, but two, <coughs> excuse me, the value also of kind of thinking through why you're doing things, right? I'm not saying that every domain has to operate the same way. Thinking through your processes and applying a federated or a fit for purpose approach to every one of those domains and every one of those data products. Not every data product is designed the same. Not every domain is designed the same. And certainly across uh, every organization, not every data mesh is designed the same. We want to build a data mesh and a domain and data products that are fit for purpose and create value for your consumer. So thank you for another great show. Episode 10 is in the books. Have a good evening or a good day. <laughs>